The Athletic. Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and I'm now joined by Seb Stafford Bloor. Who are you? I know. You've been gone forever. I've been gone for a while. Forever. And I'm here to announce that we will all be gone for a bit longer. Uh, And that is because next week there will be no TIFO podcast. We're having a bit of a break and working on a few other things before the Euros start. At which point I'm happy, I think happy is the right word to say, I'm happy to say uh, that there will be a podcast almost every day during the Euros, or or at least every game day. So there's about 23, I believe, in that period of... uh, of 30 days of the tournament there. Something to look forward to. And uh, not only that, but we will also, subject to working out how it all works technically, (laughs) we will also be live streaming the podcast on video. That's right. In 4K, I can't promise that, but uh, in high definition, on the TIFO IRL YouTube channel. Now, I hope some of you listeners will have heard of the TIFO IRL YouTube channel by now. It's TIFO's new uh, second channel, where uh, it's still TIFO, but it's in real life. So far, we've released a a, a video, I believe, with uh, Alex Stewart and JJ Bull doing their Premier League team of the season, uh, all the separate teams and sort of facing off against each other, which is quite fun. Competing teams, yeah. Yeah. This weekend, we're going to have some reaction to the, uh, the Champions League final with JJ Bull. We're going to watch the game and then make a video afterwards about how and where it was won. That'll be exciting. Uh, and yes, as I said, along with lots of videos like that during the tournament, every evening from roughly 10pm British summertime, you could uh, check us out live on the TIFO IRL channel and hear all the mistakes that we make uh, without uh, excellent podcast producers such as Ollie that we have here today to, to, to chop out all of the illegal and libelous things that we do. So hopefully we can make it through the month. If not, <laughs> we'll, we'll just we'll take it as it's it comes. probably part of a much bigger conversation if we don't. <laughs> it probably is. Yeah. Probably won't do that anyway, on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that's the TIFO IRL YouTube channel. Today, of course, we are here to discuss the Europa League final in which there were 22 penalties taken, just one miss. Sorry for David De Gea there, what a shame, we'll come to that. Uh, And also just to say, Alex Stewart is on holiday and JJ Bull is filming something exciting. So this episode will very much be, as Dominic Cummins said, a lions led by donkeys sort of affair, uh, with uh, Seb of course being the lion and myself being the donkey. But for now, I will leave you in the uh, the warm hands and the cool embrace of Seb Stafford Bloor. Okay, let's begin with the uh, Europa League final, Seb. Uh, An interesting game to watch. Uh, An interesting penalty shootout to watch. The the thing that most people are talking about this morning is uh, that Bruno Fernandes actually won the coin toss and said that Villarreal could go first, which is strange. According to certain uh, people on Twitter who've spoken to certain academics not on Twitter, uh, that took Villarreal's chances from 40% if they were to go second to 60%. I mean, I didn't know that, but uh, it feels like a mistake now, doesn't it? It does. Should we should we should we start a little bit further back, just because there are there's quite a, there's about 120 minutes of football before that, which I found quite confusing, and which yeah, but we were all, talking during it, and you also is, found isn't that quite some confusing. of that like shouldn't we start with the hot topic? Isn't that what people want to hear? Oh, I don't know. That doesn't feel very us, though, does it? I don't know. I feel hot. But you pick up wherever you want to, and we'll let the listeners decide. If they stop listening at this point, it's your fault. If they uh, if they carry on. I still, I'm still taking credit. You still win somehow, you know, just, yeah. I think there was a point in that game where I thought, right, Manchester United have won this. It was just after the equaliser and momentum has started to build. You know, you get that feeling in a game where you think, right, this is, this is only going to go one way now. Uh, And by full time, Villarreal were not just back in the game, but threatening themselves and it was just an exercise in, in how you kind of resist the opportunity to actually go and win a final. It was bizarre. In terms of game management and, and in terms of how you use your your best pieces, your best players to, to affect an outcome. 
it was just a horribly mismanaged night. And I don't, I didn't really care who won. I just, you know, nice to, to enjoy a final, even, even more so with fans. But it was just so, every time the camera um, cut to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he was kind of slumped in his chair. There was that point where he was kind of swearing at Luke Shaw for a while, which was quite weird in the first half. But I just don't understand. I, I Which bit don't you understand? Probably the substitutions. The lack of substitutes. No, not just the lack of substitutes, although that's that looks damning in, in, in hindsight. I think the identity of the substitutes, um, I find, I, I, I thought taking Greenwood off was quite strange. Um, I accept that he's young, there might have been an injury, and as always, we have to kind of preface everything by saying, um, yes, maybe um, he just reached the end of his road for this season. Cause it's been a, who, who was it's the been alternative to remove at that point, though? Because I'm gonna, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Okay. But I also okay. think, personally, to preface this next bit, uh, that yes, the substitutions uh, and the, well, the lack thereof up until 100 minutes, and then some of the personnel changes dominated the, the conversation, at least on social media that I was following. Um, I think that is uh, exactly the sort of thing that had United just won the game, would have been kind of hailed as a, as a as a manager uh, holding, you know, steely to his uh, original idea and trusting his team and actually being a positive thing, that they've lost uh, inevitably makes that the big talking point. Um, but I'm curious to know who you would have taken off instead of Greenwood to bring Fred on. It's more about who I'm bringing on. So if I'm bringing on Fred, who is a consolidating player, I want to remove another consolidating player. I, if, I'm, if I'm taking off Greenwood... Which, which one? Which one? I'm going to press you for an answer because I there think isn't. probably McTominay just because McTominay was I the best I, player for Man United at all evening. There's no way he's coming. Yeah, up. he was in the sense that he had a lot of possession. I don't think McTominay created a lot, and I think what was needed at that point was a creative touch. Somebody McTominay can, created the goal that they scored. Yeah, in a in a manner of speaking, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, like he, is, the, that corner was. There's no way United should have had that corner. Uh, McTominay's hustling and bustling, McTomessy, as I as I said in the message to you, as I moment, completely rejected when you said in the WhatsApp, yes, turned yes, four yes. people in a, in a tightly squeezed box, far, far in front of his United colleagues who hadn't managed to do any anything anywhere near as close to the goal as he had in that moment. Won a corner which they never should have won, which they inevitably scored from. He, as far as I'm concerned, he created more outfield than any other Man United player. So the, you, can, you can't take him off. He also had the kind of spirit of the team with him at the time. He was the one crunching into tackles. He still had a lot of energy. He's not an old player. Uh, who, who are you going to take off for Fred? No, but I don't, I don't think spirit of the team is really an issue because Manchester United didn't lack for desire. They didn't lack for um, competitive instinct or will to win. They just didn't have the quality to create the chances they need. And what I want in that situation is, I thought McTominay was excellent. I remember texting you to tell you that. It's just that... I need a different skill set on the pitch. I need, with that um, with that kind of opponent, I need something a little bit more cool-headed. I don't want a box-to-box player in that situation. And if I'm going to, if I'm going to bring Fred on, I'm not going to bring him on and take someone out of the final third. Like I, I don't think Greenwood played particularly well. I, I, I completely, um, I completely agree. But it's taking a body. It's taking a skill set. It's taking the ability to create one more shooting chance and to equip. I, the the key to that game for me felt like, how do United give Edison Cavani the opportunity to win this game, to score that second goal? Because I think we, we said this at the time, like Cavani, Cavani's movement is so far above and beyond any any other United player um, that it's from a f- future perspective over the long term that's quite concerning given his age and you know given his his profile. But it's also right. You have to kind of build your your in game game plan, if that makes sense, around what he does well. And there's nothing wrong with saying McTominay's had an excellent game because he did. But in a situation, and and this is situation football with an opponent wilting and ready to potentially break, I want. I, I think I want one matter on the pitch, or I I just want someone that's a little bit more composed. That's not quite as vertical in the attacking areas. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I think the issue, uh, you know, um, the elephant in the room... I got weirdly passionate about that, didn't I? That was odd. Yeah, yes, it was. It's because you were responding to me and we just... I was we, being we challenged by you. In work, in work and talk, yeah. That's how we conduct Zooms. That's for, for people... The that, real yeah. issue yeah. here is... You, stop talking. The real <laughs> issue here now. is United's squad strength, right? 
because the truth is they started a, a strong team. Um, they started Pogba in that in that midfield double pivot, and that is it's something that you know even Alex, who made the the Europa League preview video hadn't quite expected most people were expecting him to start but to start on the left hand side with one of Rashford or Greenwood to be benched and uh, with that Fred McTominay double pivot to uh, to start the game and I think you know for, 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 for the first thing to say is that it was a very positive uh, starting 11 it's something we haven't seen a huge amount this season I think obviously it showed that uh, Solskjaer knew how Villarreal were going to play the game and that United would probably need a kind of additional playmaker a little bit deeper, someone who was going to help them uh, and uh, break forwards into those edge-of-the-box sorts of areas too. And also probably knew that uh, Bruno Fernandes was just going to be swarmed by uh, Villarreal players or or, uh, or Capoue, I suppose, specifically, uh, as he was all night, barely got a touch of the ball, right? So what was interesting about it is like, you know, I look at the lineup at the when the game starts. I think, oh, that's that's very optimistic. That's actually that's exactly the kind of team that you would want to see if you're a supporter when that that when you're going into a final. The downside is, and this is something that uh, we haven't seen a great deal this season because that first eleven hasn't started very often, is that there's literally no one to bring on. Like, I mean, you've got Wan Mata. Uh, who did come on and scored his penalty very ably, as expected, and was probably the player that should have come on instead of Fred at that point in the game because he was going to slow it down, he was going to calm it down, he was going to keep possession, he would be metronomic. All of the things that you want, I think. Or Van der Beek. I mean, you could have you could have compromised yeah. and said, um, or you could have had your, your like-for-like like with Greenwood, which might have been, I mean, probably the most similar is Ahmed Diallo. Um, you could have had a player who's slightly better at moving into kind of attacking receiving positions like van der Beek, or you could just have an out and out sort of playmaker like Juan Mata. I just felt it was kind of Joe, if you were if you're a Villarreal player and you saw that substitution happen, wouldn't you think good? Because it, it's taking a I don't know that I pitch. would. No? I don't know that I would. I think I think uh, firstly I think like Fred is very underestimated as a as a player, very underrated. Um, it's not I also about... think like that subsequently meant that Pogba was moving up into the forward positions where Greenwood had been before and had been fairly ineffective or ineffective, sorry, for the last thirty minutes. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think. I mean, maybe if you are a midfielder marking Pogba specifically, you might think, "Great, <laughs> I don't have to worry about being turned every thirty seconds now." But further up the pitch, I think that is is more threatening in a way. I, I don't know. I'm mean, not not sure. I agree because I, I felt like. I felt like Villarreal did a really nice job of taking away the space from the playmakers. You talked about Fernandez, and obviously that was clearly the focus. I woke up early this morning and read an article by Johnny Lowe in The Guardian who said it was like watching United's playmakers being surrounded by a cheese sandwich every time that um, <laughs> every every time that the ball got into that sort of pocket of space you know, between sort of um, the edge of the penalty box and sort of 20 yards out. It just concertina in on them, and there was just nothing to do. And I, I feel like... In that situation, I think I want a player that likes the ball at his feet a bit more, who can create space by beating opponents rather than necessarily um, unlocking doors with passes. Even you know, despite the fact that Fernandez is excellent at it, Pogba's excellent at it, it just didn't kind of, I don't know, like but they don't you're also putting player. another player in the centre of the pitch, aren't you? You're, you're like Pogba, Pogba's most effective probably 30, 35 yards out from goal. That's that's a kind of that's where his attacking abilities are most vivid uh and i probably want a player that can not sit on the touchline but go to the goal line with the ball beat a fullback you know someone who attracts a, a double from a defense um creates a bit more space in field perhaps and i i don't know like it's you said at the beginning like it's all very well with hindsight if united had won no one cares and and you're, you're absolutely right of course you are it's just that I, I would, not just that no one cares but that people would have People could have considered that a uh, a, a masterstroke. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I I completely accept that. That's, that's absolutely right. It's just that this is the this is the nature of not winning finals when you're Manchester United because you go into a game expected to win. And I think there is a little bit of I, I think Villarreal were underestimated by some members of the British media because people just hadn't watched them and just thought, well, they're not Barcelona or Real Madrid, so they're crap. And that was pretty disrespectful. Well, I don't know if time. I did think that. I, I, I do think, though, that United were we favourites and should have won, right? And yeah, not that's that the point did. I'm trying to make. Like, I, I feel there's a little I, bit of... I think of it's br- okay if you don't know much about Villarreal. 
I, th I think it's okay. I think the problem comes when you have people working on television who don't know a lot about Villarreal. I think that's a bit weird. I disagree because I want to go on the telly and I don't know anything about Villarreal. So how dare you? Well, it's it's just uh, I don't know. Like if you're if you're Manchester United, you're kind of on a hiding to nothing, especially if you're Solskjaer, because you're expected to win the Europa League. And of course, if you do win the Europa League, lovely moment for your fans. It's the European Cup. Um, everybody else kind of ignores it though because. Well, you should. You should win that final. Yeah. And so a consequence of that is, well, how did you lose the final? Because the kind of the, you know, uh, yeah, a final is a toss of the coin. It can go either way, like, you know, um, any given day kind of stuff. It just doesn't come into the equation as much when it's Man United because you're going to have an autopsy, aren't you? It, and it's always the way. Look, they, they, they should have won the game. And um, I think whilst they didn't specifically create the chances to, there were opportunities to create those chances which weren't quite taken. I think it's very fair to say that a number of Manchester United players weren't on their game and certainly underperformed. Um, I think that the, you know one of the best opportunities in, actually included Mason Greenwood. It was at some point in the second half. There was a period after about 50 minutes where United dominated the game for 15 minutes. And um, you know you felt like this this was where they were going to get... I'm trying to remember the timing of the, of the equalising goal. It's about 54 minutes, something like that, maybe. Right. So this is in the period after that where they're, where they're, looking, they're pushing to get that second goal. And at this point, I'm watching the game. My friend Paul Ansorge, who was a massive Manchester United fan, nicest man in the world, was texting me. Paul Ansorge. Nicest man in the world. Yeah. Uh, at one one, was texting me, uh, and he was saying, "I can't." Anyway, something to the effect of like, "Oh, really nervous now, really nervous now." And I texted him back saying, "Like, no, you're going to win. You're going to win because I I have spent so much time talking to Paul this season, uh, where he's thought that, and then I've thought that watching the game." And then they've won. <laughs> In fact, the last time we, uh, the last time this exact scenario occurred, I can't remember who United were playing, but uh, they won three one anyway at half time. Well, just before half time, they were one nil down. And Paul texts me saying, "Oh, we're gonna lose." I said, "No, you'll win three one." And they won three one. And this, is, I've basically watched their games this year and been caught out every time, thinking the United this this United team is the same one of the two, the one two years ago which goes behind and never gets back you know doesn't doesn't have that capability not true this team this year is the team that goes down and comes back almost every single time to win the game right or at least to get a draw which i guess in the league you know probably would have would have been seen as a semi successful result in this kind of case uh, or or in a game which finished at 90 minutes so i sat there with great confidence in that team I didn't think for a second that they weren't going to win. Even when it went to penalties, I thought, well, oh, they're going to win because, you know, it just it just fits the sort of narrative of the season. It seems like the thing that would happen. Um, I was very surprised when it got all the way to De Gea. I had a proper football man-ism when, um, when they were just about to take their penalties, when I saw uh, Unai Emery shouting at his players and I just thought, oh, they're up for it. They're going to win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe. I maybe. fell into the trap. I just thought, oh, they just, they seem to really want them, really, really want it. <laughs> well, in any case, let, let me say, I, I, I do genuinely believe that what last night showed, uh, two nights ago for those listening, what last night showed was that, that United really lack strength and depth in their squad. Um, and the point I, I was sort of half making before was that because they don't often start with what might be considered their best team, there's always somebody to bring on that you feel could improve the team. However, in this scenario, you know, one of their, you know, a player with many more minutes than most others in the last couple of years on the bench is, uh, is, is Dan James. Admittedly, he hasn't played very much because United have stuck to that first 11 an awful lot of the time. But he's really only suited, and not to discredit him because I think he's a fine young player and hopefully will improve, but he's really only suited to games in which there's space or which they are chasing. And this was not one of those games. Dan James was never going to do anything coming on. I don't know and, and like pretty much anything about uh, Ahmad, so I, can't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really have an opinion on him. Yeah. I feel like if Wan Matter is your best option, and I love Wan Matter, I think everyone in the world must love Wan Matter. If he's your best option for this sort of game, firstly, you'd have to make that substitution much earlier than was made, but that would obviously weaken the first team, which is clearly stronger. Uh, and also, that doesn't say a lot. I appreciate Anthony Martial is injured. He or one of the other players of his calibre would be on the bench ordinarily. But it doesn't feel like... They, they didn't have the, the sort of... Um, the the uh, 
the constituent parts to win the game, did they? I mean, Villarreal did exactly what they were supposed to do. Unai Emery knew how United were going to play. He knew precisely how to stop them from playing in that way. They executed it perfectly. Their penalties are some of the best penalties I've ever seen. I mean, you know, we were chatting before the recording started uh, and uh, it was <laughs> it felt like every penalty they took was better and better and better all the way up to the goalkeeper, you know. The goalkeeper's so, penalty the, was unbelievably it was incredible. Good. Yeah. It was incredible. But I guess the point I'm making is those sorts of challenges will present themselves uh, to teams who are who are uh, hypothetically or, or supposed to be better or supposed to be chasing big trophies. It's clear to see that in, in any kind of cup tournament, even the best teams will come up against teams who are incredibly compact, very difficult to break down, and you require that extra bit of influence or something from the bench to come on and change the game. Uh, every big team needs that and has that, and United in this game just didn't have it at all. And it made you think, OK, lots of progress in the last year and a half, and sure, it's the Europa League who, who really cares. But at the same time, if they want to progress as a team further than they are now, they have to have a brilliant summer. And you just feel like that's the thing that Man United don't do. I don't know. I don't know. Well, you might be ready to move on from the topic, but I, I just... I find the management of the current resources inadequate. Like I, I accept that there's there's definitely a case for saying that there needs to be more variation off the bench, needs to be a bit more quality. I just have a tough time explaining Man United losing to um, the seventh place side in Spain, and then us kind of factoring in like didn't have the players to do it. I just don't think they have the manager to use the players. I'm not saying that they couldn't be better and that, that they couldn't have a little bit more. Um, dexterity it's just that I want to see a little bit more from what they have at the moment before I kind of commit to right well let's sort of let's garnish what we have now with you know 50 million pounds in here and and, an 80 million pound player from there and and that kind of stuff I I just I felt I I, I felt like um, and I again accept that uh, had um, had United won then it would have the story would very much have been oh one in the eye for for Solskjaer's critics but as it was and it is a fine margin but as it was it was a failure and it was Solskjaer's failure because the game wasn't managed well um, and United lost to a team that they should be. And and it's kind of, I know it's a really simplistic way of looking at it, but then there isn't really a better way of looking at it. Um, it doesn't mean that everything you, you've just said isn't true. I completely agree with all of it, actually. It's just that I don't think that's the reason they lost last night or Wednesday night, sorry. You just hate everyone, don't you? Mourinho's I do, I do. Really, I'm taking it out on, really you on the podcast. Into... Yeah. <laughs> A just... vicious little bitter boy. That's what he's turned you into. <laughs> Alex, actually, um, while you're away, it sort of it became clear that I've actually turned into an anti fan. So I don't take any joy yeah. out of football. I just take joy no. out of other people failing in football. <laughs> <laughs> That's who I am now. It's okay. I've embraced well, the character. Before we leave the topic, then, yeah, Sol Show has done that perfect thing, where uh, is there, is there is obvious progress. I mean, didn't they lose, lost the semi final last year, didn't they? Now they lost, lose the final this year. And they're second in the league. You can't get rid of them. I don't know. I mean, I mean, the the season overall, like the final, absolutely is a failure. The season overall isn't a failure, right? I don't know. I mean, I I feel like okay, and this is going to sound like we're we're kind of um, shifting shifting the kind of the goalposts on Solskjaer a little bit. But firstly, okay, second place, but second place a mile off Manchester City. Um, also, second place in a year where much closer this year though. Yeah, okay. No, that that's fair. But I'd also say uh, second place in a year where everyone else is pretty much rubbish. Strangely rubbish too. I mean, Chelsea got a lot better once Tuchel came in, absolutely. Um, and Liverpool certainly improved, but Liverpool were for much of the season an absolute disaster. Uh, Tottenham terrible, Arsenal awful, um, Leicester good season, but obviously dropped out and fell away really, really badly. I'm not saying that United didn't deserve to finish second. They did. I want to challenge the far from thing because, I mean, uh, uh, yes, ultimately the final result meant that they were something like 12 points behind, right? But there were there were uh, a few games, you know, four or five games from the end of the season where if the form had continued in that trend, it could have been a lot a lot closer. United have like lost or drawn their last five games in a row, right? I mean, they've collapsed at the end of the season, basically. Um, but had they won the games that they would be expected to win towards the end of this season, or if we'd been having this conversation four weeks ago, I'm not sure you could have said that they were a million miles away. I mean, I, I can I, I understand that they are a million miles away from Manchester City as a team, 
but technically in in the league they, they really weren't I don't know it's how it felt to me um I also I think there's a context problem here as well because we've kind of over and whether it's right right or wrong is, is not really the issue it's just what's happened is since 2013 we've kind of got used to United have kind of become this underdog which is really weird it's a and that might be just be about this kind of the the era in which I grew up but it's very hard to sort of to be having this conversation and be like well you know United were only 12 points off Man City this year and that's kind of good and it's good because of where they were but it isn't another way of looking at it it's all failure it's just the only thing that will be successful for Manchester United because of the success they've had in the past is to succeed again and to succeed in a know. very literal a, uh, way. That's no? a bit like saying like Alan Shearer has been failing for the last 15 years because he's not winning Premier League titles. I mean, no, or, because I, you know, I judge... Like I historical judge. events change, don't I mean, change things, sorry. It's not... You're absolutely right. You, you cannot uh, take away the context. Um, I think what you've said is completely insane. But then if Alan Shearer, okay, so say Alan Shearer scores 30 goals in a season and then uh, a year later, having been in no way affected by the passing of time and retaining exactly the same um, skill set. But he would have been affected by the passing of time, as no, have but, Man United. Well, as have Man they, United. Though? Are yeah, they because though? their because amazing manager got really old and left. No, All their they, best players still, got old and left. No, 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 no. Because they still have an enormous financial advantage against over most teams in the division. They still have the ability to recruit in ways that other teams don't. So yes, the individual people fall away, but as an organisation, as a team, as a as a, an entire entity, there's just it's just different types of failure. Um, Jose Mourinho won a Europa League. In which yeah. case, everything is just a different type of failure. Everyone who didn't have exactly the season that they ex- it's exactly what I'm saying, to. Joe. This is the new well, me. That's like just everything a negative Nancy. is failure. That's not okay. This is, yeah, but no. this is your fault. You went away. You 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 <laughs> took time off. You decided you wouldn't watch football, and you encouraged this bitter podcast monster to grow. <laughs> it's your responsibility. Well, I'm going to shoot you in the back of the head as soon as this is finished. And hopefully the nice Seb crawls out of that corpse. The season is nearly over. I need a bit of a sleep. We'll have a week off the podcast. I will emerge into uh, Euro Championship land, uh, Euro 2020 land in in a far better place. I'll tell you what will make you feel better. Go on. Let's put an advert here. Yeah, lovely. I love an ad. Yeah, do it. Hello, I'm Mark Chapman and I'm here to tell you what The Athletic has planned across its podcast network during the Euros. My pod with David Ornstein will become The Athletic's England show throughout the tournament to bring you all the latest news and insight from inside the England camp every single day. Then we'll also have nightly editions of the Totally Football Show, taking a look at all the big talking points from the competition and looking ahead the next day's fixtures now if you're feeling nostalgic for tournaments past we've produced an eight-part documentary series that tells some fascinating stories from both on and off the pitch from the last eight euros elsewhere michael cox's zonal marking pod will offer an in-depth tactical breakdown of all the biggest games while adam hurry's football cliche show will take a look at the tournament's alternative storylines so as this never ending domestic season finally draws to a close we'll have plenty of Euro 2020 coverage for you to enjoy as the tournament gets underway in just a couple of weeks time all right that was an advert great what else are we talking about? I haven't watched any other football, Seb. I watched the uh, relegation promotion playoff in the Bundesliga. Bundesliga is fine. Hey, do you like that? Con- <laughs> what? Fuck's sake. Hey, no, 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 no. We're going to broaden it out so that you can Tell us involved. who the teams were. Who won? So uh, Cologne... Did everyone uh, fail? <laughs> Cologne failed big time. Badly, badly. So the um, the relegation uh, promotion playoff in Germany is exactly as it sounds. It's a two-legged game between um, the team that finished third from bottom in the Bundesliga and third from top in the Zweite Bundesliga. And um, it's great. Like, the concept's great. Um, yeah, I like We're halfway that. through and uh, Cologne uh, lost at home to Holstein Kiel. 
Um, great game. I think what it is that I like is the quality, because of the situation, because how fearful everybody is, the quality suffers a little bit. And so the yeah, game is yeah, very yeah. fractured and um, very loose. But I love the jeopardy. I love the kind of the, um, I love the fear. It's it's like, a, it's not just a playoff where you're trying to get to Wembley and if you don't get there, oh, okay, but then status quo next season. For the losing team, it's a catastrophe. And yeah. that's what I like. I just, I, I, I'm addicted to, to the concept. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. It's, um, the, this is releasing on a Friday and the second leg of that game is on Saturday afternoon, Saturday early evening. Oh, so it's not over yet. No, we've had leg one of leg two, of, of two even. And um, yeah, the second leg is just before the Champions League final on Saturday evening. So give that a watch. Yeah. Horst and Kiel play some good stuff. They, um, they're a funny team um, who bottled their way out of automatic promotion um last weekend um but they play attractive football and they um yeah i think they're gonna go up and uh clone are, clone are just absolutely dreadful absolutely dreadful they should have been relegated off leg one i spent 40 minutes in cologne once very nice cathedral there isn't there well yes i was changing trains and the two things i remember is uh, the beautiful cathedral just outside the train station uh, absolutely magnificent, huge baroque structure, gothic appeal. Loved it. It was fantastic. Uh, and then the other thing was six. Uh, of, of I can say, and I, I hope I don't offend any German people here, but the most stereotypically large, frightening German men, all armed police guards, marching around in formation around the station. I've never seen people who frightened me as much as these men. They were huge, and I'm big. You know, I'm big, Seb. I'm you are very, six foot very four, yeah, and I'm broad leaning. built. And you know, I'm carrying, I'm carrying a, I'm carrying a little bit of extra. I'm rotund, put it that way. These men were bigger than me, and they had automatic weapons, and they had funny hats on. And they just, I, you know, the word hench finally made sense when I saw these men. <laughs> I was frightened. I didn't know I did anything wrong. I was an EU citizen at the time and, uh, you know, no longer. Thank you, Brexit. And uh, I was just, just just changing trains, officer. I'm just changing trains. But I uh, practically I practically pooed my pants. They were frightening. Lovely cathedral there, though. And uh, pretty sure I had a, had a sandwich, which was uh, fine, you know? It was adequate. Yeah, what else is going on in the land of football? We've got the Euros coming up, haven't we? That's very exciting. I mean, next time you hear from us, actually, it will be a Euros-related podcast, I think. It will do indeed. I was going to actually um, plug a bit of athletic coverage because uh, this morning Jack Pitt broke the story that uh, Tottenham and Maurizio Pochettino are negotiating a potential return. That's is that actually true? It's actually true, yeah. Is that I read a rumour about that yesterday from a very disreputable source. No, it comes from The Athletic now. It comes from Jack. We know it to be true. Uh, I don't think it's a certainty. What the hell? Oh, that'd be just wonderful. Why? Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Why would he go back? I don't know. No, I'm being serious. I don't (laughs) understand why he would go back. I agree with you. I don't get it. I don't know. I think it's a, there's been a kind of a um, collective getting off of the managerial carousel over the last 24 hours. So um, Antonio Conte has left Inter Milan. And we're recording this on Thursday and we think Zidane is going to be leaving Real Madrid today. So there's all kinds of landing spots for interesting people. Oh, and that, now United do need to get involved in this, don't they? <laughs> nah, so... <laughs> Some people around. Come on. <laughs> so you've got probably, I don't know, it makes kind of sense for Zidane to go to PSG. Um, Conte to go to Real Madrid Conte would be a great Real Madrid manager I think um, he'd last a year and a half and, and then fall out spectacularly with Florentino Perez but then he'd probably win a European Cup before he did it just because he's with Conte. his defensive football which the fans will love well, it, it doesn't really matter though because like success trumps everything like I Conte's got this terrible record in, in Europe um, and he's he's kind of like he's got calamity after calamity after calamity and so for him it makes sense you go to the club associated with um, success in, in the Champions League and you kind of break your duck there. Um, so, yeah, be interesting. Pochettino back to I, Spurs. Yes, I please. feel like Pochettino has literally only just left. Yeah, I feel I'm ex- extraordinarily surprised that he would want to come back. On the basis that it's 18 months ago and in the interim there was a lot of Jose Mourinho, does not feel like he only just left. <laughs> I can tell you. No, I guess that's, I guess that's true. But it feels like it's been I quite mean, a while. Why did he, didn't he leave in... There was some kind of like minor dispute, wasn't there? And presumably if he's coming back, that means that Daniel Levy is committed to spending a lot of money on players. It's an interesting thought because you'd imagine that 
if it does happen, and, and we must stress that it's not a, it's not a certainty, it's a, apparently a conversation, according to the Athletics reports, um, that it would involve Daniel Levy, you know, showing some humility and acknowledging some mistakes and saying things like, yeah, maybe I should have listened when you started talking about that long and painful rebuild that you uh, you predicted, you know, because Pochettino has been proven right, hasn't he? And um, uh and you'd imagine, whilst they apparently they got on very well as, as as people, but you'd imagine that if you were to come back, the dynamics in their relationship would be very, very different. So that'd be very, that'd be fascinating. That would be. I'm sorry, I'm just struggling to get my head around it. It feels like I felt like that was a kind of parting of the ways that we'd be talking about for a long time in the future. Uh, I could never, I could never have envisaged this happening. I think. Well, it, it's not. It's not totally unpredictable because Pochettino did say that he'd he'd always want to return, um, and Levy didn't quite say the same thing. In, in a kind of he was lost in a Mourinho days um, in those weeks afterwards. But it was it was clear that it probably wasn't going to be permanent, um, and we don't know if it's going to happen now. But I mean, it wouldn't be that surprising. And Pochettino just fits the culture very well. I think he's um, yeah. Forgive I would me. like it. Is all that you can say. Is that your Ronan Keating? That's a great song. Yeah, that's my Ronan Keating, yeah. Uh, maybe Harry Kane's triggered it. Maybe. Those two are very close. Maybe. They were BFFs, weren't they? Maybe they're texting each other going, I'll stay if you come back, pal. And it was just a joke, but then it's like, maybe it can happen. Yeah, and then days. everybody lives happily ever after. Well, yeah. I don't. I think you'll change forever, but we'll see. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? There's nothing here, is there? There's nothing. It's the end of the season. What was your favourite thing about the season? Uh, the night the Super League story broke. It was just wild. And and seeing sure. the increasingly untenable position that a lot of really dislikable people got themselves <laughs> into. And the interviews. And, and uh, I think my favourite moment um, was probably when a very broken, very uh, tired Andrea Agnelli um, gave that sort of interview in which he had to admit that it was all over. It's just great. Yeah, it's just, just yeah. absolutely great. This is my. This is where my anti fandom comes in, and also um, the the Florentino Perez interview on the Tuesday night. And actually, for those who've been paying attention this week, that was week, mad. It was mad, but it, it gets worse because for those who've been paying attention this week, Juve, Barcelona, and Real Madrid have uh, released a joint statement in which they insist just that they are acting. I mean, are they still in the Super League? Is that the thing? They are still in a three-team Super League and they are still insisting that they are acting um, with the game's best interests at heart and that if they're not allowed to have their Super League, football is finished. It's well, a, it's so, an amazing... So they're not in the Champions League next season then? I don't understand how they're maintaining this position. We still don't know. So UEFA's position is that they're going to kick them out of the Champions League. Get them gone. And Get them gone. those three teams are kind of... Um, you presumably composing emails to the Court of Arbitration for Sport and we're heading for one of those in inverted oh. commas. Yeah. I think so. they should try and kick everyone out. I think oh, they should yeah, kick just... all of the teams out that try to do it and have a really fun year without any of those teams. And it sounds fun, but actually it's probably just like watching two Europa Leagues, isn't it? I mean, the thing about all those teams is yeah, they're a bit shit at the moment. Like the Champions League at the moment, Champions League probably wouldn't miss them. Uh, from a footballing perspective, I mean, Man City and Chelsea are in the Champions League final. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Not sure you could say that. <laughs> I don't know, but like, if you, if you, it wouldn't you, miss them except. Uh, oh, what you mean all twelve? The teams. Oh yeah, I mean all twelve. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. I thought you meant the three that are still in the Get Super League. Get them gone. I mean everyone oh. that tried yeah, to sure. do it. I um. Have you read the? Have you read the the most recent statement? It's a fabulous piece of writing. It's um. It's a real voyage of, and it involves things like, you know, our institutions are all 100 years old and we're European citizens. And it's just, it's like, it's like for, the, for those who, who remember it, it, it was like the, it's like those statements that Randy Lerner used to release when he owned Aston Villa, just like an odyssey. It's like a, it's like the kind of the, the football statement version of um, Jazz Odyssey by Spinal Tap. It's just blank piece of paper, write whatever comes down, um, you know, say anything that feels good or that sounds like it's a compelling argument against, you know, what you're being accused of and just release it. Don't even proof it. Just release it. Just press send. 
And then I guess I guess the idea is that sort of lots of lots of um, very partisan, angry fans then go and do all the heavy lifting in public and shout down journalists who who say things like, "Oh, you know, I think the Super League is bad, and I think sealing teams off at the top of the game is bad." Let's shout that down. Sure, sure. Mm. Hey, do you want to do a Joe's quotes and facts database? Yes, yes, I do. Yes. Please. Okay, here's Joe's quotes and facts database. <laughs> It's Joe's Quotes and Facts Database. And today it's actually uh, the Quotes and Facts Database of Rahul Karia, who, uh, or Karia, I'm not sure how to say your name, Rahul, uh, but uh, Rahul uh, messaged me on Twitter uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with a note uh, including a couple of quotes and facts of some, of some players. You've outsourced and said, this. I know, he said he was very happy for me to use them. <laughs> This is thought, never. That's great. This you've segment said, I tell you has never had a lot of preparation, but you've you've reached a new level of laziness with this. Well, Raul was actually asking if there were internships available or if there was you know staff vacancies. Uh, it's probably a good good place for me to address. At the moment, there aren't. Um, I mean, you're always welcome to message me and, and ask if there are. But most of the time, the answer is well, almost all the time, the answer is going to be no. But I did say in response to that. However, I, I very much appreciate the time you've taken to send over these two examples. At this point, I'm putting my hands together, going, hmm, hmm. Would you mind if I used them on a future episode? That would make one of my Sunday evenings about sixty minutes shorter. And he said, "Of course." I mean, I put him in a position where he couldn't say you no. Spent sixty minutes preparing quotes and facts database. Mate, there's not that much funny stuff out there. You don't understand. <laughs> It we takes are, you ages to get... I go through we, five players to get one. You, I can't just read any old crap, but this is some fine stuff. We are about and, 48 hours removed from a conversation about misallocation of resources. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and bad uh-huh. use of time. The company. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Axel Twenzebi. Axel Twenzebi. Quote and fact. Fact is, uh, according to Raul... Uh, on a pre-season tour of the USA in 2018, Axel broke the world record for clearing a game of hungry, hungry hippos <laughs> completing the game in 17.36 seconds. According to the Manchester Evening News, however, there is no footage of Twanzebe actually carrying out the attempt, only a photo of him posing with his certificate. Uh, the article also states that the record was previously held by the League of Their Own cast, James Corden, Jamie Redknapp, Freddie Flintoff and Jack Whitehall, which begs the question, Rowell asks, how Twanzebe on his own managed to beat a record set using the combined efforts of four people. Uh, also, Raoul suggests if you do get a second, you should check out his Life Bogger page, <laughs> which is brilliant. <laughs> that was apparently a source of the Manchester Evening News. Thank you to Raoul oh, the Manchester okay. Evening News. And the quote... When asked by some school children what normal thing anyone can do uh, that he likes, Axel replied that he plays the piano. The pandemic, he said, has made life a bit repetitive. So when it gets really bad, I just play the piano. Which is nice, isn't it? That's, That's nice. a nice quote. Yeah. yeah. There is one more on uh, Bruno Fernandes. Uh, and uh, here we go. Here we go, Bruno Fernandes. In fact, Bruno Fernandes had a poster of... Can you guess? Up on his wall. Can you guess? Is it a I'll give you a clue. It's a footballer. Is it? Is it? It's Manuel a footballer Rui with, a, with a, the name of a nation as his surname. Ooh. Um. Hmm. Hmm. Is this good podcasting? Hmm. Probably not. Is this what Tell people me. want to hear? Hmm. Bruno Fernandes had a poster of Stephen Ireland on his wall growing up according to ireland bruno told him that as a kid he had a poster of of me ireland i'm so sorry about that uh, motorbike he said that when he played football manager he always signed me this is Stephen ireland talking apparently the pair well not anymore apparently the pair now live in the same neighborhood of manchester and quote get on like a house on fire in fact fernandez often goes round to ireland's house for a kickabout with his youngest son according to talk sport and uh, there you go. That's the quote, uh, the, the fact about uh, Bruno Fernandes. And the quote, of course, Fernandes often likes to poke fun at his teammates. He apparently once said in an interview that he likes to practice free kicks after training with Juan Mata, Marcus Rashford and Alex Tellers. But he continued, of course, by saying, and I think this is a fairly famous quote now, Fred also stays, but it's just to have fun with us. Because <laughs> he's, you know. Yeah. Not the not the uh, the sharpest free kick cookie in the box cutter is he? He's uh, 
I mean, I think he's a great player. I think he's a great player. I think he costs £50 million. But he's a great player. Anyway, that was the end of Joe's Quotes and Facts database. And uh, it's probably the end of the podcast, Seb, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Good, good, really strong Quotes and Facts, though. That was a real tour de force. Yeah, Thanks fine. to Raul uh, Carrier, who, if, you, if you'd like, you can follow on Twitter at uh, Raul Carrier 8 that is spelt R-A-H-U-L, K-A-R-I-A-8. Yeah. Go and follow him and say, the Tipos attack, the Tipos are attacking. That'll be funny. I mean, I don't know how funny it would be, but uh, it would be a thing, you know. Anyway, that's all for now. Uh, of course, don't forget you can subscribe to The Athletic or you can get a 30-day free trial by visiting theathletic.com forward slash TFO. Uh, and uh, thank you, of course, to, to you, Seb stafford Blore. My pleasure, Joe Devine. And to uh, producer Ollie for his hard work on today's episode, uh, which probably will be hard. Lots of, lots of things to cut, maybe. And some pop-pop-pop-popping to fix. So uh, thanks to Ollie in advance. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will not be here next week. I know. What a crying shame. But we will be back uh, for the week of the Euros. Our next episode will be released on Tuesday, the 8th of June, in anticipation of the tournament beginning on the 11th. And then we'll be here from the 11th, basically every day for the rest of your lives, assuming that some kind of world-ending event occurs before the end of the Euros. So that's very exciting, very exciting times. Uh, for now, I will say au revoir, Tipos. Goodbye. The Athletic.